Welcome back to part two, where we are going to be talking about how Exodia became a tier zero deck overnight due to Konami not being able to sell these premium packs at the Tokyo Dome due to the riot. If you haven't seen part one, I'll be sure to leave a link down in the description so that you can find out what the heck I'm talking about, about a Tokyo riot, uh, or excuse me, a Tokyo Dome riot. But yes, I'll leave a link to that in the description. But for now, let's go into part two, where we cover how Exodia becomes a tier zero deck. Exodia the Forbidden One is an iconic card in the franchise, and rightly so. Rather than simply being a strong card, Exodia is a full-on alternate win condition, a set of five cards, four limbs and a head, that once in the hand together, simply end the duel in the user's favor, regardless of what state they were in beforehand. It is the first such win condition in the franchise, and by far the most enduring. This was not least because of its manga prominence. At the end of the long, grueling Death T arc, Yugi managed to successfully unlock its win condition while playing in what looked to be his final showdown with Seto Kaiba his greatest rival. It managed an amazing reversal, pulling Yugi out of a complete losing situation where Kaiba had managed to play all three of the only three copies of Blue Eyes White Dragon, the strongest and rarest card known in the game. It was treated as a true shoot the moon moment when Yugi, in a pure leap of faith and willpower, drew the final piece to complete it, apparently the first time the condition had ever been successfully met. It was adapted into the first episode of the anime, and in terms of how many memes it's inspired, it's easily the most well-known moment in the franchise. For people who grew up when the game was popular, the image of a completed Exodia is essentially a shorthand for victory. Even the series itself famously had the cards be thrown into the ocean by one of Yugi's opponents so they would tilt the odds too heavily in his favor. Even more recently, we've seen a Olympic track runner assemble all five pieces of Exodia, which was really cool to see. Which is why it's an absolute shame that Exodia will go on to cause the worst format in the game's history. Firewall, FTK decks, Dijin, Necroz, the Dragon Ruler, Spellbook format, Zodiac, and Chaos Yada, these were decks that dominated tournaments, that locked the opponent out of play, especially for Chaos Yada, that essentially mandated players buy very expensive cards to keep up. I have personally played decks from all across the spectrum and watched duels from countless eras, and yet throughout all of them, I must say, if I were able to travel back and play the game at any point in history, then the absolute lowest point would be the period between November 1999 and February of 2000, and a lot of it comes down to Exodia itself. The thing about Exodia is that it doesn't require you to actually do anything involving your opponent. You just draw the four limbs in the head, and that's it. You win. Congratulations, Sugar Boo Bear. The difficulty involved is just in drawing enough and surviving enough to do so. If you were lucky enough, you could theoretically pull it off the moment you drew your starting hand. And while Yugi was playing the five pieces as a backup strategy mixed in with a pretty standard deck for the time, this would be a terrible idea since the Exodia pieces are essentially worthless by themselves. Because of this, players immediately realized that if they were going to play Exodia, they were going to devote their entire strategy to it. Getting Exodia in itself was not easy. I've already gone over the blood, sweat, and tears that it took to get the premium pack. It wasn't easy to get, even in its mail-away form. But the four limbs released piecemeal across the prior few months were no less absurd. The left and right leg had been released at ultra-rare, the highest standard of rarity at the time, across two different packs. In short, the full set of Exodia needed to play the deck would probably run the equivalent of hundreds of dollars, and that's just for a single set. You could theoretically run three of each limb. But once you had the set, Man, let me tell you something, that's when the true curse of the premium pack became unleashed. The curse of retribution for the events of the 26th of August. Because far from the shoot in the moon, one in a million impossible odds depicted in the manga, assembling Exodia wasn't just possible, it was the best possible strategy. Pot of Greed allowing its players to draw two cards, and sparking a joke that will likely flood my comment section now, was playable at three copies. Graceful Charity allowing the player to draw three cards before discarding two was also playable at three. Do you see where I'm going with this? In the modern game, both are obviously playable at zero. They're banned and have been for, at this point, a decade and a half now, since one provides free extra cards and one replaces bad cards with new ones while setting up the grave. If you had three copies of both, that was a good part of your deck drawn out. 
These two cards, when combined with defensive cards like Swords of Revealing Light and a steady supply of wall monsters and Magician of Faith to recycle Pot of Greed and Graceful Charity, meant that stalling out with Exodia became quite viable. It was essentially the first alternative to quote-unquote good stuff, but it wasn't quite there yet. That would come with two very familiar monsters in November. Sangin and Witch of the Black Force should be recognizable to any longtime players of the game. They're relatively low strength monsters that, when sent from the field to the grave, let the user add a monster with low stats from the deck to the hand. This effect is considered so powerful that extra restrictions were placed on it in later era releases. It is entirely unsurprising that they'd be used in Exodia decks, but it would be more surprising that they used to be even more powerful. The first printings simply claimed that they could use their effects simply when sent to the graveyard at all, such as when being discarded by Graceful Charity, and suddenly, getting Exodia pieces into the hand was hilariously easy. And coming out in December to complete our hideous combo, we have Wabaku, which was essentially a free turn where the opposing player couldn't do any damage. And last, Will. This card allows you to summon a monster with low stats from the deck when a monster is sent from the field to the graveyard by any means during the turn it's activated. It's considered one of the best summon from the deck cards ever made, and it's banned. And this is the version we currently have, which is restricted to once during the turn it's used. The original release, however, was so poorly worded it could summon from the deck every time a monster was sent from the field to the graveyard during that turn. Sangin and Witch both had low enough stats to be summoned by, meaning you could simply crash into a stronger monster with anything, summon a Sangin or Witch, crash again, use the destroyed Sangin or Witch to search out a piece of Exodia, use Last Will, summon another Sangin or Witch from the deck, and repeat until Exodia was fully assembled. This was a combo that could be done on your first turn if your opponent had something in attack mode. The only way to block this was to know that your opponent was playing Exodia and set all of your monsters, and this would involve trying to out stall a stall deck with a much clearer win condition. Yes, less than a year after its creation, Yu-Gi-Oh had a one-card OTK and a deck that could also manage an FTK if it got lucky, and there was absolutely nothing that its infant metagame could do about it. The game was brand new, there were no hand traps back then. There were only two cards that could slow it down, Magic Jammer and Solemn Judgment and only Morphing Jar and Needleworm had a chance to actually fully shut down Exodia, and that was with luck or an opponent that didn't have a lot of copies. Former powerhouses like Gemini Elf and Summon Skull struggled to break its defenses or deal enough damage to end the game when they did. Destroying its monsters only made it stronger, targeting its back row resulted in Wabaku activating in their face and stalling at another turn, and even if everything went well, a single successful last will resolution would end duels altogether. Even if Exodia was irrevocably discarded, Cannon Soldier provided a perfectly viable backup plan when combined with Last Will, and nearly every card involved with the exception of the Exodia pieces was a common. And the deck wasn't even fun to play in a solitaire kind of way, nor was it complicated. You just played everything in your hand until you ran out of draw cards and then stalled if you didn't draw Exodia on the first turn. I would dare say someone who just learned the rules of the game could win with this. Accounts from those who played it talked about how once they finally did manage to assemble a full set, they'd still usually give the deck up because it was just too boring to play. Exodia mirror matches were perhaps the truest example ever of that common bit of card game hyperbole. The biggest deciding factor was who won the dice roll and went first. I want you to put yourself in the mind of a young Japanese boy who idolizes Yugi Moto. You've played a lot of games in the playground and you're walking into a card shop to take part in a fun duel. Maybe make some friends. You put your deck down, hope your beloved blue eyes, the cards you got in that starter deck, can carry you to victory. You look over your opening hand and see blue eyes and a graceful charity and a monster reborn you saved up all your pocket money for. Immediately. A strategy starts flowing through your mind, a way to summon blue eyes on the first turn. You know what Yugi says, no matter how great your opponent's cards are, as long as you believe in the heart of the cards and with skill and fairness to trust the deck you made, you will always have a chance. Doesn't matter how strong Seto Kaiba makes his deck with his endless wealth and connections, Yugi will always beat him because he trusts in himself. Then, your opponent, a fellow 10 years your senior with a persistent body odor, 
wins the die roll and plays Pot of Greed, Graceful Charity, another Pot of Greed, another Graceful Charity. Then he activates Sangin in Witch of the Black Forest, searches two cards, reveal his hand. You've lost before you even got your turn, Sugar Boo Bear. You've never seen a completed Exodia before. You own a right arm and your friend has a left leg, but that's it. And yet you see it now glittering with foil, all five pieces. No, wait, six pieces. He's actually got two left legs, pimp. On that day, as you go home crying to your mama, you have learned a valuable lesson. Seto Kaiba is real, and he always wins. February of 2000, the second limited list revision ever hit. Among other power cards, all five pieces of Exodia were limited to one copy, as was Pot of Greed and Last Will, and Graceful Charity was limited to two copies. The limited list had swollen from three cards restricted to one, to eleven cards restricted to one, and three restricted to two. What was more, around this time, Sangin and Witch of the Black Forest were re-released with erratas that elaborated further you could only use their effects if they were sent from the field. To the graveyard. Exodia had been thoroughly gutted and never even approached the dominance it once held. To this day, all five pieces remain on the limited list and have not moved off even once. In April, the Dual Monsters anime, the show you most likely watch as a kid, saw the release of its first episode. It was an immediate success and brought a swath of new players into the game. That same month, Magic Ruler, the first set to have its own name rather than simply variants of volume or booster, was released, significantly ratcheting up the game's complexity. With Exodia now a non-threat, the new fans had a great environment to play in. Even if many players had quit due to the disaster at the tournament or the soul-crushing Exodia metagame, they'd been replaced by a new batch of wide-eyed youngsters poking at a card vending machine and begging their parents for starter decks. The Tokyo Dome riot, due in part to preceding the franchise's explosion in America, is now largely forgotten. In Japan, it is remembered at most as an odd historical curiosity, a short time when everything involving a kitty franchise went horribly wrong and people got hurt, similar to Pokemon Shock. In America, it's almost completely unknown. The first ever copy of Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon planned to be given to the winner of the tournament that never was, later resurfaced in 2014, and uh, apparently it sold for 1.2 million yen, and was put on auction again in 2018 for 45 million, though I can't say if there are any takers. Later on, a number of print runs made it much easier to obtain. There's something deeply ironic about the fact that a manga that built itself around the theme of befriending others through gaming and dealing out justice to those who play unfairly became responsible for people harming each other for gaming and trying to win at any cost. Takahashi originally based Seto Kaiba on an elitist gamer who had told him to not bother playing unless he collected a thousand cards. And now his work, born of exaggerating that one asshole at a card shop, had essentially become a reality. The often mocked idea of people going utterly bonkers for pieces of paper of inscrutably wicked and frivolous corporations of criminal activities and smuggling of people spending thousands of dollars on decks just for cardboard and of rare cards beyond imagining was far closer to reality than anyone fathom. And I'm pretty sure that Takahashi felt none too great about all this, because in November of 1999, he began the Battle City arc, the manga's second major tournament arc. The first opponent introduced was a member of a criminal organization using an Exodia deck, and like the players in real life, he played multiple copies of Exodia, suggested to be counterfeit, and multiple copies of Graceful Charity. He introduced himself by blindsiding Joey and taking his best card, Red Eyes Black Dragon, assaulting him with a group of thugs for good measure. Yuki faces off against the criminal, and despite wall monsters, heavy draw power, use of Mark cards and perverting the original idea of friendship and defying the odds into a cold calculus of passivity, Yugi manages to defeat him in six turns over the course of less than two chapters, destroying his entire combo without even taking damage. Directly afterward, the main villain of the arc takes over the criminal's body and declares that he was the weakest of his servants, and Joey interprets his loss to a guy like this as a sign that he isn't worthy of red eyes, and begins a quest for self-improvement. The criminal vanishes from the story forever and never even gets a name, although some video games go with Seeker. Exodia had been reduced from a nine-divine reversal hidden within the deck of Yugi's beloved grandfather to the one-dimensional strategy of a cowardly and nameless mook. Strange though it might seem, at the time, that chapter may have well been a statement of defiance, just as jerk gamers in the real world had inspired Seto Kaiba, so too would they play the villains in the arcs to come. I hope you guys enjoyed the part two to this very long uh, history story time, but I thoroughly enjoyed reading this originally on Reddit. Again, uh, shout out to the gentleman that put uh, this whole story together. It's it's incredible where the game has come from and the fact that a riot took place at the Tokyo Dome. Just to have them go back many years later um, to you know have a live stream and have people there and I guess have a fun time. There was no riot, so that's good. Guys, 
Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.